and uh, we've been continually harassed over the keel. I mean, we've spent a lot of money. I mean, we've been coming 10 years to try and win the America's Cup. Uh, our syndicate spent, let's say, uh, well in excess of $10 million getting this far. The Australians caught a member of the Canadian team diving around the underbody of Australia 2 in mid-July. A security guard spotted two men. One got away. There were threats of filing charges, but the incident ended with an appearance in court and a public apology by the Canadians. It was, however, an isolated incident. Dealing with the New York Yacht Club was a full-time job. Well, we're starting to get confused as to what we're doing here, uh, Rob. We go to sea each day and uh, win a yacht race and then come ashore and start the war. So it's becoming quite confusing. We've been here before and we know they play the game uh, pretty hard. And uh, here we are again. We've raced 35 times. As you know, we've won 32 of those. And all of a sudden, after 35 races, our boat's peculiar. It's peculiar, of course, because it's damn fast. Don't forget that uh, to us, it's still a sport and uh, some, someday somebody's going to have to lose in any sport. And uh, I, don't, I don't think it will mean anything other than that. Uh, uh, sure, we don't want to lose it, but we don't want to give it away either. It had been a grueling summer, both on the water and off. Now it was time to race. <laughs> Only till January 20, save $1,000 on superseded Chimeras. Save on new Holden Astra. Unstoppable Gemini from just $7,250. Or get terrific savings on Holden Shuttle or Holden Jackaroo. Happy new, happy new Holden. The Gone Person, whichever's your style, will make it worth your while. See what you get for your own one. Happy new Holden. What's a welcome cry when your throat is bone dry And your arms start aching while it's breaking your back <gasps> What's a welcome cry to the forest down south When that almighty crack breaks the silence down the track And the cry goes out right across the state Would you go and export pipes? Would you go and export pipes? If you want to see Australian animals in their natural habitat, the place to go is Kahuna, a very special park set high in the Darling Range. Just 35 minutes from the city centre, Kahuna abounds in wildlife. Here, wallabies and wombats, kangaroos and koalas, penguins, parrots, pigeons and pelicans live in true Australian bushland. Come for a ride on the Kahuna Express, and you can enjoy a picnic or lunch in the tea rooms overlooking Perth. Whatever you choose to do, Kahuna Wildlife Park is an experience you'll never forget, for it's as close to nature as you'll ever get. Your Holiday WA Travellers Kit is available right now at any participating Shell service station. Each kit provides you with a Holiday WA Travellers Check booklet, which can save you hundreds of dollars on WA holidays and travel, and 14 different and exciting telethon tour maps. With a $15,000 Nissan Patrol four-wheel drive to be won from Gordon Crump's Duncan Motors, plus the chance for your kids to win Commodore home computers in Channel 7 State Affair game, your $4 kit with all proceeds aiding telethon represents incredible value. Get yours today and Holiday WA. More than 1,500 spectator boats jammed the area around the America's Cup buoy, nine miles southeast of Newport Harbor. The 24.3-mile triangular race course included six legs, one upwind, two reaching legs, another upwind, downwind, and back again upwind. Australia, too, edged Liberty out at the start by a slim three-second margin. Liberty avoided close maneuvering with the reputedly quicker Australia, too, but instead opted for a windward berth across the line. Shifting winds up the first leg left the boats playing hopscotch for the lead. By the first mark, Australia 2 was ahead by eight seconds. Liberty inched up on Australia 2 in the second leg and took advantage of a narrow range of superiority in reaching to pass her in the third leg. In the fifth leg, strange things began to happen. Australia 2, which was supposed to be slow downwind, started gaining until she was in a controlling position to leeward of Liberty. Suddenly, Liberty got a puff and jibed onto starboard. The quick maneuver forced Australia 2 on port tack to dive under Liberty's stern in hopes of getting the inside overlap position at the bottom mark. The sudden maneuver resulted in a snapped sheave on Australia 2's steering mechanism. 
Without the use of her rudder, skipper John Bertrand had to fight for control of the boat with the trim tab. The gear failure cost Australia two the race. Liberty won by one minute and 10 seconds. Halsey Harishoff, navigator on Liberty, seemed pleased but cautious about the results. Well, we feel very good, but the real key to the race was the run where we got on the left side, which wasn't so good, had the wrong side of a shift, had to change spinnakers, and they caught us. And then we ended up, really because of their troubles, I think, having that good lead at the bottom mark and more of a lead after we got started to windward there. But, you know, that's all part of it. It's a uh, matter of the crew work and uh, all the different elements that could be involved are a part of these races. And uh, the boat that wins has to have things go right most of the time. September 15 dawned much as the day before, chilly and with an 18-knot norther blowing its way across Rhode Island Sound. It looked as if the advantage belonged to Liberty, and indeed it did, but for the wrong reason. Australia, too, incurred yet another gear failure. Minutes before the start, the mainsail ripped away from its headboard car and slipped 18 inches from the top of the mast. Connor and his Liberty crew decided that they would keep their distance in case Australia 2 decided on fouling Liberty at the start as a way out of the dilemma. By the time the 212s reached the first mark, Australia 2 was ahead by 45 seconds. A favorable wind shift on the right side of the course worked in her favor, overcoming even the rigging failure. On the reaching legs, Colin Bischel, an Australia 2 crewman, performed a high wire act, climbing the mast in an effort to jury rig the damaged headboard. Connor took advantage of the ailing Australia 2 and Liberty's innate ability on the reaching legs to reclaim 24 seconds from Australia 2's lead. In the fourth leg, the shifting winds made a hero out of Liberty and a martyr out of Australia 2. Connor and crew caught a lift on the right side of the course and moved ahead. Australia 2, which was making the best of a bad situation, was headed on the left side of the course and sailed into a hole. When the two boats came back together, Liberty tacked across Australia 2's bow and then came back to tack on top of her for a lead she carried to the finish. The cross maneuvering cost Liberty a tense session in the protest room, where the crew had to convince an international jury that it didn't tack too close, as the Australians charged. Liberty won the race by one minute, 33 seconds, but it was another day before it was assured of victory. Bob Bevere, a member of the New York Yacht Club who saw the protest incident from the Goodyear blimp, guessed the outcome correctly. So protest dismissed. That's my guess, but I think it's going to be a close one. September 16 was a lay day. The third race, scheduled for the next day, turned into a non-race in which Connor and crew were saved by the clock. The southeasterly breeze that offered a reasonable 8 to 10 knots at noon evaporated into a miserly two to three knot puff by mid-afternoon. Liberty paid the consequence in relative boat speed by trailing Australia 2 in the ghosting conditions. When the time limit was called at 5.25 p.m., Australia 2 had left Liberty wallowing in a patchwork of windless holes. At the fifth mark, the white boat from Australia was five minutes, 57 seconds ahead. Race three was resailed the next day. It marked the turning point for Australia 2. She sailed a nearly flawless race. Australia 2 forced Liberty to tack away just before the start. As Liberty headed out to the right side of the line, she was forced to head up to avoid hitting the anchor road belonging to the race committee boat Black Knight. The maneuver sapped Liberty's momentum and gave Australia 2 the charge she needed to lead at every mark and finish three minutes, 14 seconds ahead. Well, Liberty's a fine 12 meter, there's no question about it, and, and uh, is being sailed and will continue to be sailed very well, and she's going to be very tough to beat. Um, it's, in all honesty, it's early days. We haven't raced Liberty enough to get a real feel for her comparative performance, but, well, she's beaten us twice, and we've beaten her only once. So she's obviously pretty good. I believe yesterday you claimed God was an American. Does he have Sundays off? <laughs> no, but uh, even he couldn't cope with Australia 2 today. <laughs> Liberty called a lay day September 19. On September 20, the wind was moderate at 10 to 15 knots southwest. It was Liberty's kind of day. By the fourth race, there was no doubt left aboard the American boat that its Australian counterpart was faster. 
Knowing this meant that the only way left to win a race was to take risks, calculated risks to outsmart the opponent. Race four was just that kind of race. Connor and crew knew enough to avoid the conventional tacking duel that goes on before the start. Liberty was no match for the nimble Australia too. She could, however, outwit her, and she did. Liberty approached the starting line from the left side on port tack. Australia too was heading up on the right side with the starboard tack right of way. Liberty hung on to cross Australia 2's bow, a maneuver that worked, but just barely. Farther up the leg, Connor needed to tack to port, but again, Bertrand was in control on starboard. Connor took the risk and held on, just able to tack across Australia 2's bow. The move was daring, and it got Liberty around the first mark, 36 seconds ahead of Australia 2. Liberty held on to that lead through the two reaches, lost time in the fourth and fifth legs, and then rallied in the sixth to cross the finish line 43 seconds ahead. It was a weighty day for the Americans. They won a race on sheer merit and determination. There were no excuses. Australia, too, had also sailed well, but not well enough. Dennis Connor and his red boat, it seemed, were back on track. The score was three races for Liberty, one for Australia. John Bertrand continued to be optimistic. We're going to be approaching tomorrow <clears throat> with a vengeance. And that's what we're all about. <coughs> no waning of confidence whatsoever. No, we're going to go out there and, um, and do the job and turn the tables. That's our whole objective. September 21 turned out to be an ominous day for the American boat. An 18-knot southwest breeze had produced a morning chop on Rhode Island Sound. About 40 minutes before the noon warning signal, trouble developed. The piston that controls the port jumper strut exploded and broke the strut. Connor sent two men aloft. First, Tom Rich at the top spreader, and below him, Scott Vogel. The job wasn't easy. Clinging to the mast on a day like that was like trying to hold onto a flagpole in a hurricane. The two men worked feverishly to repair the strut. A jury rig was in place just in time for the noon gun. Liberty entered the starting arena without her headsail. When the crew tried to raise it, the luff tape split, and the sail fell to the deck. Another one went on almost immediately, but it was obvious Liberty was having problems. He drove Australia 2 down to the pin end of the line, forcing his opponent over early. With Bertrand having to re-round, Connor chalked up a 37-second lead. His luck, however, didn't hold. Four minutes into the first leg, the jumper strut gave way again. The strut, which controls the bend at the top of the mast, left a noticeable sag in the tip. Australia, too, moved up on the troubled Liberty, but then was forced to tack away to the left of the course for clear air. Connor, who by this time was nursing Liberty along, let Australia, too, go in hopes that he might pick up a favorable shift on the right. His game plan was to round the first mark ahead. When the boats converged ten minutes later, Australia, too, was ahead. She rounded the mark with a 23-second lead. Liberty held on in the two reaches, but Australia 2 ate her way through valuable seconds in the remainder of the race, finishing one minute, 47 seconds ahead. John Bertrand's optimism proved right. Quite obviously, um, having to return in um, a yacht race like that is um, hard to take, and as a result, you've got to lift yourself up very quickly, and I uh, give all credit to my crew for doing that they're just fantastic they said well come on Bertrand get let's get into it and um, so we did as for Dennis Connor and the Liberty crew confidence was clearly waning I'd rather be um, three wins and two losses than two wins and uh, three losses so I don't feel comfortable and obviously Australia is a, a very good boat and uh, very strong in all wind conditions and until um, one person wins uh, four races in this series, we uh, will all be wondering who, who the uh, winner is going to be. The weather seemed steady and favorable for Liberty on September 22, the day of the sixth race. The score was now 3-2 to two in favor of Liberty. If the Red Boat won this race, she would have the America's Cup. The winds were...